Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, The man who has lived the most is not he who has counted the most years, but he who has most felt life. In this episode, I'm sharing my takeaways from Benjamin Hardy's book, Slipstream Time Hacking. So let's dive in. Welcome to the School of Self-Image, where personal development meets style. Here's your hostess, Master Life Coach, Tanya Lee. Hello, gorgeous friends. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I've had such a fun week. I just have to share it with you. I went to my bestie Brooke's house for Thanksgiving. It was her family and my family and friends. It was a Friendsgiving. The thing that we like to do when we all get together is play games. And typically it's card games or board games. But this time it was pickleball. How many of you all have played pickleball before? It is so much fun. I cannot play enough. (laughs) My friend Brooke was like, you're like an addict. I get out there. I'm like, let's play one more game, one more game. One day we played like six hours. That's how much pickleball we played. And now I feel like my hips are confused. They're so sore. (laughs) They're like, what just happened? But pickleball will be a regular part of my life moving forward. I wish I could put a pickleball court at my new house, but the lot's not big enough. Unless I put it in the front yard. (laughs) Can you imagine that? A pickleball court in your front yard. I don't know that my neighbors would appreciate that, but it would be fun. But can you all believe it's already December? Where has the time gone? In some ways, it feels like this year has gone by so fast, but in some ways it feels so slow. I was talking to my friend the other day about something that happened two years ago. And we were like, oh my goodness, that feels like a lifetime ago. Feels like forever. And yet it was just two years ago. Time's a really interesting thing, isn't it? That's why I want to talk about a concept called slipstreaming. I was introduced to this concept by Benjamin Hardy. Some of you may know of him. He wrote the book, Willpower Doesn't Work, and Be Your Future Self Now. And I was in a mastermind with him years ago, and he gave me a copy of his very first book, and it's called Slipstream Time Hacking, How to Cheat Time, Live More, and Enhance Happiness. And that book really spoke to me. In fact, I've reread it probably two times since he gave me that copy. And I referenced the term a lot, especially amongst my friends. Just this past week, when I was with my friends at Brooke's house, we were sitting around the table and we were talking about how we all have had an impact on each other. And in many ways, Brooke has been my slipstream. She has allowed me, by being in her velocity, I've been able to go further much quicker. And in some areas of life, I've been her slipstream. I've been able to take her further much quicker. And that's the beauty of being around amazing and powerful people. We can get into their slipstream and they can carry us further, faster than we could ever do it on our own. And if you talk to successful people, They will all tell you. They really think about it. They had a slipstream. They had someone. It could have been a book. It could have been a podcast. It could have been a real life person. It could be an opportunity that came up because they were at the right place at the right time that because they were there, it took them so much further than they could have ever done it on their own. The best way to think about a slipstream is to think about cycling, If you've ever watched the Tour de France, you can see evidence of a slipstream. I remember watching Lance Armstrong at Tour de France and how I was always confused by his approach. I wasn't used to cycling at the time. And he would be behind a group for a large portion of the race. He would conserve his own energy. And at the very end, he would break loose and just take off. By being in their slipstream, he was able to go faster and ultimately win the race. A slipstream is defined as the flow of air directly behind a fast-moving object, such as a car, 
plane, boat, bicycle. And it can also be the flow behind a person. And that's the context that I'm using in today's episode. I think about my membership, for example. I am the slipstream for so many of my members because I'm teaching things that took me years to learn and I'm giving it to them in a much more concise, digestible, and easy way. So they're able to go so much further, so much faster than I was able to. But I've also had my own slipstreams that because of these people, I was able to go so much faster than I could have ever done on my own. That's the beauty of this work is that we can take advantage of slipstreams when they appear and we can also be a slipstream for others. So I thought it would be fun for this episode for me to talk about some of the main takeaways that I had from Ben Hardy's book, Slipstream. And this is a first. I don't think I've ever done a book review, a book summary, a book takeaway in the history of this podcast. So if you like this, let me know. Okay, so let's talk about some of the main takeaways that I had from Slipstream Time Hacking by Ben Hardy. The book opens up with a really great question. How will you measure your life? If you think of how most people measure their lives, it's in years, it's in time. But one of the main lessons and principles of Slipstream is that we should measure our life as distance traveled rather than time elapsed. Ben asked the question, how would each day look if rather than passing through 24 hours, we measured how far we moved that day? 24 hours doesn't mean anything. If we measure time as distance on our deathbeds, we could say it took me 80 years or however long we lived to get from point A at birth to point B, the accumulation of life's experiences and meanings. This is so good, you all, because a lot of times people will say to me, you know, in the next three to five years, this is where I want to go. This is where I want to be. But when you think about slipstreaming, you start to think about how can you collapse that time even more? What if you could do it in a year instead of three to five years? Ben asked the question, what if you could live and breathe every moment of your 80-year life in the first 25, thus extending your earthly possibilities by 55 years? He goes on to talk about Einstein's relativity theory and how that theory says that time is not sequential or fixed, but rather it's flexible and nonlinear. It can be stretched, squeezed, bent, changed. This book will blow your mind. This is why I've had to read it several times from front to back to really understand what it means to slipstream. But then I started to think about my own slipstreams and how I was able to get somewhere so much more quickly than had I not found what Ben calls your wormhole. The example he gives of his own wormhole is meeting his wife. When he met her, he had a lot of debt and she was in a better financial situation. So in one meeting, one person, one slipstream, he fell through a wormhole at the age of 24 that dropped him into a space and time approximately 20 years into his own future. So without his wife, had he done it by himself, sheer determination, It may have taken him 20 years to pay off all of that debt and create the financial wealth that he ended up creating with his wife. That is a slipstream. And we find slipstreams by dropping through these wormholes. Understanding this, I can now look back on my life and see all of these wormholes that I felt through that allowed me to get into a slipstream. For example, I do feel for me that Paris was a wormhole. Going there for the first time, I was able to quickly see a different way of living and being that probably would have taken me many years to figure out if ever on my own. The same goes for masterminds that I've been a part of. 
they have introduced me to concepts and there's like such an energy and a velocity that's happening in those rooms and they're moving at such speed that I get caught up in their slipstream. And without even a lot of effort, I find myself in a much different place even after a year of being in that energy. A place where maybe without that mastermind, without being in the presence of those people who were my slipstreams, it may have taken me 10 to 15 to 20 years to get to. The next thing that I learned in this book really blew my mind and made me think about how I'm not only living my life, but my days. Because I want you all to remember this, a well-lived life is nothing more than a collection of well-lived days. So with this idea of slipstreaming, I started to think about the distance that I travel in a day. What results have I produced? What have I learned? How much have I grown in a single 24-hour period? So what the book says is if we measure life by distance rather than time, some people may travel great distances on a given day while others can't remember a single significant thing they did. Listen. There have been many days where I look back, I'm like, what did I do? Just felt like I was going through the motions, just doing what I was expected to do. And as a result, I don't feel like I was getting traction and actually making progress or distance. Now, how do we measure distance? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. But for me, it is progress made change experienced, experiences had, and it could even be distances traveled quite literally. And the example that Ben gives in the book is this guy that he met through couch surfing, where I guess he was a host for people who were couch surfing. And this guy had sold everything he owned and he took a leap and he decided that he was going to travel the world. And he experienced 32 weeks of travel in a single year. And he was talking about how most people, they'll never experience that in a lifetime. In fact, the average American, I think has like a two week trips every 52 weeks. So this guy had experienced 16 years of vacation in just eight months. So when you think about looking at your life and time as distance traveled rather than time passed, you can start to see how you can move really fast. Like when I think about my life in that way, I'm like, I am moving so fast. I'm covering a lot of distance in a shorter amount of time than most people. Why is that? And I can tell you, it's not because I'm special or have some gift that you don't have. The first thing is that I set really big goals for myself. I call them extraordinary goals. And Ben says it in the book, if your goals that you're pursuing do not require wormholes, your approach to life is far too small. The highest pursuits available are those that literally require exceptions to the rules because such aims cannot be done conventionally. When I set these big goals, I have to think in such bigger ways. And me thinking in such bigger ways allows me to access possibilities that I would never access without having had that really big goal. The other way that I feel that I'm able to travel a lot of distance in a shorter amount of time is by focusing on results. So when I'm planning my days, when I'm planning my weeks, even when I'm planning my years, I'm always focused on creating a result in a certain amount of time. This is very different than sitting down and working on something. Working on something can lead to just a lot of busy work. When I sit down and I look at my calendar, I can see what needs to be completed. What is the finished product that's going to happen during this time slot? And because of that, I'm able to make a lot of progress in my days so that at the end of the day, I'm like, wow, I really accomplished a lot. And listen, y'all, I know that feeling of not having that direction. In fact, I was telling a fellow entrepreneur of mine, who's also a friend, who feels like she's not making a lot of progress. I told her, I'm like, one of the hardest things to do is to figure out what you want to accomplish in a day. Once you do that, then you just have to show up and do what you've said you're going to do. But especially when you're in business, 
that can be the hardest thing to figure out. Like, what do I need to be focusing on that's going to carry me the furthest in the shortest amount of time? And in my business, that typically comes down to sales and marketing and fulfillment. So making sure that I am offering my clients, my existing clients, the best possible experience, as well as doing the work to expose more people to the school of self-image and what it is that we do. The other reason why I feel like I'm able to cover a lot of distance in a shorter amount of time is the speed of my decisions and the magnitude of my decisions. So bigger decisions and shorter amount of time to make decisions helps me to cover a lot of ground. I think back to 2020, I feel like I lived four or five lifetimes in that one year. And that was the year I made huge decisions and I made a lot of them. And so for any of you that feel like you're not getting momentum and you're not moving as quickly as you would like to, you're not covering a lot of ground, look at how maybe you're not making decisions in your life. Even looking at next year, I'm spending right now the week planning out my 2023 and I'm making big decisions. I'm planning for the results and I'm doing it quickly. I'm not going to spin an indecision. And because of that, I feel like I will be able to cover a lot of ground in 2023 compared to how I used to move, let's say 10 years ago. The next lesson that had a big impact on my life was Parkinson's law, which states that work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. This means if you give yourself 10 years to reach a goal, guess how long it will take you? 10 years. But what if you only gave yourself a year? How would you have to think differently? How would you show up differently? What choices would you make that you're not currently making? Ben argues in the book that to slow time, one only needs to set shorter timelines. If the goal is to get to Hawaii in 15 years, reduce that timeline to 15 months and voila, put on your flower t-shirt. If a task is perceived to be unimportant, it will take enormous amounts of time to complete. Conversely, if a task is perceived to be important, it will get done soon, sometimes immediately, depending on how important and urgent the task is. So if you want to cover a lot of distance and live a lot of life, use Parkinson's law. Use it to condense time. Give yourself less time to reach your goals, less time to finish tasks. And as someone who has done this, I can tell you, for you perfectionists out there, this is going to be difficult because we're used to giving ourselves a lot of time to really overthink and make ourselves miserable, constantly fixing and editing and improving and never really putting our work or our dreams and desires into the world. When I started to give myself less time to complete things, number one, I was way more focused I didn't even have time for that chatter in my head. I'm like, listen, you got an hour to get this done. Let's go. And as a result, I've been able to achieve a lot more in less amount of time and been able to cover more ground than a lot of people. And using Parkinson's law is one of the ways that I've been able to do that. So here is an example that Ben gives in the book. He's so smart. I love this book so much. You have to get a copy of it. But he talks about him and Tim. They had the same goal. If Tim could accomplish this goal in one day, like make a successful multi-million dollar investment, the same likely would take me 10 or more years. So Tim is moving over 3,650 times faster than me. He's talking about himself, Ben. Thus, time has dilated 3,650 times for Tim. While he can now set grander and greater goals, I continue plugging along. One day to Tim is 3,650 days to me. When I read that, that blew my mind. Because what I see is Tim is experiencing the compound effect. What that one slipstream did for him where he was able to make a successful multi-million dollar investment has now compounded his success. And so he's able to go even faster in relationship to distance covered in his life. 
He also talks about Bill Gates is another one who's moving so fast. He has potentially traveled the same distance in his life as the combined distance of millions of people. When you think about all that he's accomplished. So Bill Gates has lived the same years as most people do from a linear chronological perspective. However, from a non-linear perspective, he is squeezing the same amount of life into seconds that most people experience in their lifetime. I love that he says the goal isn't an infinite quantity of time, but the highest quality of time. This is where time slows. He goes on to say, people who think I will be happy when are speeding up their time rather than slowing it down. In other words, they believe that once they accomplish a certain task or goal, only then will time slow. If we could learn how to get to where we want instantaneously, we could learn the truth that happiness is now. Time can slow now. There is always a way to get to where we want to go almost instantly. He also says change doesn't have to take a long time. It happens the instant we decide. And I've been experiencing this a lot lately. I used to believe that it took a long time to change. And as long as I thought that, guess what? It took a long time to change. And I will say that when you first learn the power of your mind and you're not used to practicing it, it takes a while to really grasp the practice and the concept. But now I can see in my life where I'm like, I'm done. I'm changing. Done. Not talking about anymore. It's time for a whole new way of being. And that one moment, that one decision, I can feel change inside of me. He also says change doesn't have to take a long time. It happens the instant we decide. And I've been experiencing this a lot lately. I used to believe that it took a long time to change. And as long as I thought that, guess what? It took a long time to change. And I will say that when you first learn the power of your mind and you're not used to practicing it, it takes a while to really grasp the practice and the concept. But now I can see in my life where I'm like, I'm done. I'm changing. Done. Not talking about anymore. It's time for a whole new way of being. And that one moment, that one decision, I can feel change inside of me. So think about whatever it is that you just keep struggling with. You keep coming back to it. You keep wanting to get coached on it. What if you just decided, I'm done. I'm done with the self-doubt. I'm done with the people pleasing. I'm done. And you committed to that decision and you practiced out that decision. You may find that change doesn't take that long. And so what happens is you free up all of that energy of working on a problem that's not really moving you forward to now having that energy to focus on tackling issues and obstacles from the future, new issues that are going to grow you and help you to create the results that you want. One of my favorite sections of the book is called throwing yourself into the fire. And it starts out with a quote by Mario Andretti, where he says, if everything seems under control, you're not going fast enough. (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) I'm going to repeat that. If everything seems under control, you're not going fast enough. Listen, I know I got some control freaks in my community. I am one of them. I like to control things. But when things seem under control, I do know that our goals aren't big enough. We're not moving fast enough. And I believe one of the biggest myths that so many of you are struggling with is that one day you're going to have it all under control. But what if that's not the objective? What if you attempting to keep everything under control is causing you to not live as much life as is possible for you? What if that is what's causing it to take so long to get to Hawaii when you could be there in five weeks instead of 15, trying to control everything. When you set these big goals and maybe you are in a slipstream, it's going to feel jarring. It's going to rock your world. It's going to challenge your identity. And so what we often do when we're in these moments, is like, let's hurry up and get through it, <laughs> right? Many of my clients would be like, can you hurry up and help me feel better? And I'm like, what, what's the rush? Why are we trying to hurry up this process? And he talks about in this chapter, I thought it was so interesting, 
when pilots experience turbulence, guess what they often do? They slow the plane down. To speed it up can cause negative effects. So they actually have to slow the plane down when it's going through turbulence. So when you find yourself experiencing the growth and the pain of growth and the pain of change, and you've literally thrown yourself into the fire and you feel like you've lost control, first of all, just know that's normal. That is the secret to not only change, but I think to success. And don't add resistance by trying to hurry up and get through it. Just relax, slow the plane down a little bit so it can get through the turbulence most effectively. You all, I feel like I need two hours <laughs> to share all of the little notes that I've written from this book, but it's so good. Here's another thing that he said, not only is time the ultimate currency, but in actuality, time is our only currency. Our time is the only thing that really belongs to us. Everything else belongs to the world and the universe. We can't take our money or stuff with us when we die. Although we may own something, we don't really own it. At most, we are stewards over our possessions, but they are ultimately the earth's. The only thing that is fundamentally ours is our time. To waste our time is to waste ourselves. Gosh, that is so good. Makes me think about how we're spending our time. Are we spending our time on the things that we really want to be spending it on? That is growing us, fulfilling us. That is helping us to create the visions that we have for our lives. He says there are three distinct requirements for personal freedom. Number one, a heart at peace. Number two, healthy relationships. And number three, upright character. There are many successful businesses, but few successful families. I remember when I started my business, I had a big fear, like a lot of people do, that it was going to cost me my family and my relationships, that I was going to become a slave to my business, because there are a lot of examples of that in the world. But I decided that I wanted to be an example of what I call leisurely hustling, where I combine my ambition with my ease. And because of that, I've had the most incredible experiences since I started my business. Now, I have friends who've grown their businesses much more quickly than I have. But when I think about the life I've lived over the last 15 years, I've lived way more life. I've traveled more. I also didn't own a lot of stuff. So I didn't have to work in such a way that I had to pay off a lot of stuff because I didn't have a house. I haven't had a car payment. I've saved up my money, paid for my cars. And so I didn't have a lot of debt. And because of that, I didn't have the pressure of like, oh, I need to make so much money to pay for stuff, which is the situation a lot of people get themselves into. So I've grown my business more slowly revenue wise, but I've also lived well below my means (laughs) over the last 10, 15 years. And because of that, I've been able to live so much life because I wanted to not only have a successful business, but I wanted to have a successful life. It was so important to me. And so for any of you that are afraid that you're going to sacrifice your family and the things that mean so much in order to be successful, I want you to challenge that statement. It's not true. Find examples and evidence of people who have done it in a way that feels aligned and true to you so that you know that it's also possible for you. I believe you can have a successful business and an extremely successful family life and life in general. In our world with limitless options, limitless books to read, limitless clothes to wear, limitless paths to take, it is extremely important to be picky This is so good. Think about all of the things that are vying for your attention on Instagram, which podcasts to listen to, which books to read, where to go on vacation, what clothes to wear, what to eat, 
Like we have so many options and so much coming at us that we have to be very discerning about what we allow into our world. It's why I'm always preaching about our environment. It's very important that we don't bombard ourselves and suffocate ourselves with people and things and objects and options, but we are very selective. It just frees up our mind. It gives us more space to live more fully. He also says that those who become the greatest and go the farthest are highly selective about what they take on. They are clear on where they want to go and recognize that most of what life offers will not get them there. Almost everything in life is a non-essential distraction. God, that is so good and so true. For me, it's why I love to limit my teachers. I like to have a max of three teachers at any one point. And usually there are three teachers in very different areas. But a lot of people, they'll go out and get three or four coaches all in the same area, and then they become confused and conflicted. And it's almost like they're just stuffing their brain with excess in hopes that that's going to be what gets them there. I love getting rid of distractions, having focus, knowing where I want to go, and then finding the person or two that I think can help me get there. That is how you make progress. He says, most of us engage in far too many priorities. If we have more than three, we have none. And I've been preaching this for years. I always believe you should, you should have no more than three priorities. And in my membership, I always encourage my members to have just one extraordinary goal. Why? Because you can get laser focused. You can live so much life in a year by going after that one big goal versus allowing your attention to be splattered to four or five tiny goals. That one big goal is going to change you way more than you know four or five, six little mini goals. But when it comes to your priorities, if you have you know 10 priorities, do you have any priorities? Or is just everything a priority in your mind? And if everything is a priority, then nothing really is. I love this saying in the book. Despite turbulence and other conditions keeping the plane off course 90% of the flight, most flights arrive at the correct destination at the correct time. The reason for this phenomenon is quite simple. Through air cap traffic control and the inertial guidance system, pilots are constantly correcting. Essentially, the plane is on a straight course and keeps getting nudged a degree off course here and pushed a degree or two off course there. When immediately addressed, these course corrections are not hard to manage. However, if a pilot only occasionally checked the course, the aircraft could potentially become so far off course that the requisite corrections would take substantial time and resources to execute. Whew, that was a mouthful. But hear what he's saying. If you know where you want to go and you're constantly making corrections when you're off course a little bit, chances are you're going to arrive at your desired destination on time. But it's when we don't check in with ourselves and we get so off course that then it feels like it's going to take forever to get back on and it is going to slow you down. So checking in with yourself, having that awareness is how you stay on course. And the way that I do that is to constantly check in with my emotional guidance system, check in, see how I'm feeling, what am I thinking that's creating that and course correcting, getting myself in an emotional state and checking the progress on my goals that I have. Checking the progress for, you know, my extraordinary goal. I'm looking at every month, where should I be? Am I close? If not, what happened? How can I course correct? Doing that will help you arrive at where you want to be, if not on time, not too far from the time that you gave yourself. Here's another takeaway. True commitment can only occur when turning back is no longer an option. This moment constitutes conversion in the highest regards. Failure is no longer caused by a lack of commitment. If you're going to fail, you're going to fail epically. If you're going to succeed, you will live at your highest level. Listen, y'all, what if we all decided to fail 
epically. And I'm not talking because we were scared and we didn't show up, but because literally we gave it our 100% and it didn't work out. Most people don't fail in that way. Most people fell in the privacy of their own homes and in their own mind because they're not even trying. They're not even going out there because they're so afraid to fail. I was actually talking with my business image mastermind ladies about this very topic. And what I told them is that I got so much power when I literally burned the bridge. So for example, when I left nursing, it forced me to figure things out. As long as I was in nursing, I had something to fall back on. But the moment I walked away, I was like, okay, sister, let's go. See what you got. And I've done that several times in my life because it called forth a new part of me. I've told the story on here, but when I moved into a penthouse, I was like, okay, let's see what you got. Can you live in a penthouse? Turns out I could but I didn't give myself an out. I knew that to fail was going to have a big consequence. And so it forced me to go all in. And it just so happens that when you go all in, your chances of success are way higher. Another thing that he says in the book is when you commit to something 100%, all of your future choices are already made, no matter how attractive the circumstances. And that's true. When you decide what your vision is for your life, when you set those big extraordinary goals, within that decision, other decisions are made. You are deciding where you're going to focus your time and energy, where you're going to focus your attention. And so it requires that you have to tune out a lot of the other possibilities. You have to say no a lot. Here's another takeaway. Avoid checking email or answering the phone during the first few hours of your day. That time is sacred. Checking your email is simply a database of other people's agendas. Thus, by checking your email at the beginning of the day, you have already set a pattern that your day is not going to be designed by you, but someone else. Y'all, this book is so good. (laughs) I could keep going. Like I said, I feel like I need two hours, but you can see it's all about time and leveraging your time. And this one is big. This is why I love to take time out in the morning for myself. I love to journal. I love to read. I love to listen to music. I love to get into my zone. I love to really focus on my state of being because if I don't, I'm going to get swept up in the world's state of being. And you all know that that is usually not a place that we want to be swept up into. The next takeaway is so big, and I wish I would have practiced it earlier. He says, leveraging other people's time skills, and money is essential for getting where you want to go faster. You simply don't have the time to do it all. I know that there are many of you listening to this who are trying to do it all, and you're exhausted, you're overwhelmed, and you're burnt out. And that starts to affect you physically. And you may feel like there's no way out of this, but I want you to consider that the best way to get out of this is to get support. It is okay to delegate. It is okay to hire people. If you look at the most successful people, they didn't do it on their own. They are surrounded by people who help them, who have skills that they don't have, who have passions that they don't have, who do things way better than they do, thus freeing up their time to focus on their goals and their vision. This next takeaway is powerful. And I want you just to consider the truth of the statement. He says, we all have invisible doors in our direct proximity that will transport us decades into our best futures. And this is so true. No matter where you are in your life right now, You are surrounded by individual doors. I always say you're just one decision away of changing your entire life. And I think about those invisible doors that I finally found that changed the trajectory of my life. I would not be here had it not been for me stepping through these wormholes into a slipstream. One of them is coaching. 
I am a hundred percent sure that I would not be the woman I am today without hiring a coach, without joining coaching programs. I think about the women who join the school of self image. That is the invisible door that was made visible to them. And once they step through it, they are never the same. They can't go back. It changes them. And I'm sure if we were to do a study of these women and watch them over the course of a decade or more, we would be able to see how that one decision completely changed the trajectory of their lives. This has happened to me when I've joined masterminds, when I have discovered certain teachers, when I've gone to certain places. Right now around you, Even though you may not be able to see them, I want you to know there are invisible doors around you, close to you. I want you to start looking for them because when you step through them, they will transport you decades into your best future. Here's another great takeaway. Life is filled with an almost infinite wealth of hard decisions. You're bound to fumble along the way. (laughs) It's going to happen, y'all. Don't try to avoid it. I think the more you fell and the faster you fell, the quicker you're going to be successful. So don't try to avoid the heart. Don't stay stuck in indecision. I always say the most important decision is the decision after the decision. Deciding how you're going to feel about it. And I don't care how my decisions turn out. I always choose to feel proud of myself. I always choose to feel confident in my decisions. Because I know that decisions give me power. I know that I need to make a lot of decisions. And so to make those decisions and then doubt them and regret them, there's just no upside ever. So I just always choose to feel good about them. And I know that they'll lead me to the next thing that I'll need to decide. But a lot of you are so afraid of making the wrong decision that you don't make any decision and then you feel stuck. You're going to fumble and it's okay, but you're going to be fumbling forward. And that's what's important. Okay, my last takeaway from slipstream time hacking is this. When the end of life comes, we leave with nothing but our relationships. And so what does that tell us? In our pursuit for success, in pursuit of our extraordinary goals, don't take your relationships for granted, especially the relationship that you have with yourself. Make sure that you are a priority in this quest and this adventure of life. And make sure that you're carving out time to spend with those that mean the most to you. Because truly, without relationships, what is this experience? Pretty dull and lonely. I hope you all enjoyed this review of Slipstream Time Hacking by Benjamin Hardy. Let me know. If you enjoyed this, I definitely have other books that I would love to share with you that have had a big impact on my life. I hope you all have a wonderful week and I will see you in the next episode. Hey, have you grabbed your free copy of the School of Self-Image Manifesto? If not, what in the world? Head over to schoolofselfimage.com forward slash manifesto and get a copy that teaches you how to think and show up in the areas of mindset, style, and surroundings so that you can transform your self-image.